And now it seems our star day has come, Novorossiysk. In the dark nights that enveloped then your coasts and mountains, as we counted the hours and minutes until this hour X. For too long we had to wait for it, and now it has come, Hitler's notorious blue line was the turn of the day. Actually, the reader knows it already from our previous story, and the battles over it and earlier did not stop for a minute. But now it was necessary to break it in order to move to the west. It's the southern facet of the blue line, says Marshal of the Soviet Union, Aya Greitko. A length of 25 kilometers passed through a difficult mountainous and wooded terrain from the station Nebojevskaya to Novorossiysk. Here the defense was built taking into account the creation of multi-level fire in combination with forest debris, and a whole system of anti-personnel nine explosive barriers. The captured part of Novorossiysk Hitlerites turned into one of the most fortified areas of the Blue Line. In the area of Novorossiysk, the enemy feared the landing of our paratroops, so here he prepared a powerful anti-landing defense. The whole coast up to Anapa was strongly fortified. Its approaches to the city from the sea were covered by a dense system of pillboxes and bunkers, which were located in the western part of the port. All piers, breakwaters, port buildings were mined. Mines were set not only on the shoreline, but also on the water and underwater. Between the western and eastern breakwaters, the Hitlerites set up booms, connecting them with mines and land. On the heights outside the city, the enemy equipped artillery observation points, which allowed him to correct the fire on any part of the bay. Until fighters Starikov and Krasnov had to take the fight in the most disadvantageous situation for themselves. They were covering a marine bomb MDM Bia 2, and to get away from it would have doomed it to death. And when eight messes fell on them from the clouds above, their first thought was to shackle the enemy, to tie him up in battle, to give the heavy machine a chance to get away. Cutting off the Hitlerites from the scout, Starikov and Krasnov, rushing then on one enemy fighter, then on another, dragged me 109 in a furious air carousel depriving the Hitlerites of free manoeuvre and the opportunity to attack the BR-2 with him. It was like that only in the first moments of the battle. Having recovered a little, the vultures split into two subgroups. Three fascists decided to take Starikov in pincers. Three Krasnov. War correspondent Grigory Sorokin, on the hot tracks of the battle recorded from the words of Lubimov, amazing monologue Starikov in the air. Lyubimov listened to him on the ground on the radio and, needless to say, what experienced the regiment commander in those fleeting moments of air combat. And it was so. The tension of the battle reached its limit when in the headphones Lyubimov her pro. Hey, bastards on one attacked? No, we'll not take bastards as on one. We're running out of ammunition. Starikov was already addressing the ground. Give me help. We're running out of ammo. We're running out of fuel. You should have helped. Serves you right, you bastard. You shot one down? Well done, Krasnov. Hit him. Finish him off. I wish I had ammunition now. You won't get away, you fascist bastard. From the ground they saw how Starikov managed to get into the tail of one of the messes. There was a machine gun burst. Very short, probably. It was the last cartridges. And suddenly Hitler's machine began to fall apart in the air. So Starikov hit the target. So did not miss. At first, the wing of the messer separated from the messer. Then, tumbling, all that was left of the plane flew and back in the diner. Out of fuel. Old man, honey, hold on a minute, shouted into the microphone hoarsely Ubimov. Help is coming. Hold on, darling. One minute, hold on. A trio of our fighters cut off the messers, already smelling an easy prey from the wounded old man's car. She steeply went to land. Krasnov also fell back. He, who shot down one messer, also ran out of fuel and ammunition. They barely reached the airfield. Starikov pushed back the cockpit lantern, with difficulty got out on the wing. He didn't jump to the ground, he fell down. His legs did not hold him. Just the arrow showing the fuel reserve in the tanks had been shaking at zero for a long time. The most vivid pages in the history of fighting in the Caucasus aviation of the Black Sea Fleet wrote in the period of major air battles over the Cuban. This period, which lasted about two months in the summer of 1943, was a turning point in our struggle for air supremacy. The arrogance and self-confidence of German pilots was finally broken. From that moment, they not only in the South, but also on other fronts refused to fight actively, counting only on some random surprise attacks, and in all other situations they tried to break away and get away from the sin. 
in the battles over the Cuban, along with such renowned aces of army aviation, such as Alexander Pokrishkin and others, among the Black Sea pilots especially distinguished Nikolai Normov and Ivan Lyubimov. They were the ones who led young pilots into battle and carried them to victory by their example. Lyubimov gained special respect for himself. He rejoined the line of combat pilots and skillfully beat the enemy in the air and on the ground. The Germans lost in the Cuban most of their selected aviation and were no longer able to support from the air retreating their ground troops under the blows of our troops. We flew freely and searched for the enemy as true masters of the Caucasian skies. It is recalled how after the liberation of Annapa, says Denisov in his letter, I with a group of comrades arrived there and what we were burning desire to know whether the familiar people are alive and above all those at whom we were quartered before we left this city. We drove up by car to the house where I once lived. The lady of the house came out and threw herself on my neck and wept. At first I thought that it was from the joy of meeting old acquaintances, from the joy of welcoming us as liberators of the city. However, we soon learned that the Germans had on their books all Soviet pilots, primarily regimental commanders, who caused them the most damage and spread rumors among the population about our death, saying that, say, there was nothing left of the Soviet aviation, that those pilots who were considered in the Black Sea and the Caucasus Ace were killed. So I was buried alive. That's why, seeing me alive and healthy, the landlady of the house where I used to live was so excited. Contrary to the wishes of the Germans did not die under Black Sea aviation, on the contrary, it became a mighty force and was ready to crush the enemy in the air, on land and at sea. In its ranks there were new divisions of attack aircraft, torpedo bombers and fighters, guards and artillery units, which with honour carried the banner of victory from the Caucasus to the Crimea, then taking advantage of the lull on other fronts. The enemy concentrated on the Tarman Peninsula, its best air squadrons. Many enemy air units were also based in the Crimea and southern Ukraine. German bombers made massive raids under the powerful cover of fighters. Our pilots in the battles over the Blue Line met with the latest enemy aircraft Mi-192 and Mi-194. They told us that these fighters have powerful armament and strong engines. It is difficult to keep up with them, especially on dive. It appeared here and a machine like our attack aircraft. Junkers 87. The squadrons bore the names of famous German pilots UD and Melders, who, according to the thought of Hitler's command, should inspire young Aryans to perseverance and courage. Such was our enemy. Failure. That day I was inexpressibly angry. Anyone who has fought will realize that such an opportunity in the military fate falls once and not to take advantage of it. It was, at least, foolish. Everything seemed to promise luck in this extraordinary situation. Everything if it were not for one but me. After the fight, the guys joked and laughed at me, and, to give them credit, what happened was really quite comical. In addition, this story quickly became publicized and spread far beyond our regiment, having once opened a fresh issue of the magazine Crocodile, which arrived to us. We read the following lines. Mikhail Avdiv lazily ate a few spoonfuls of soup, pushed his plate away, and left the table. Generally speaking, this replaces the operational summary for those who know him. So there was no battle today. Avdiv did not manage to fly out. Nothing added to the combat account of the guards. A wasted day. And on such a day, Avdiv has no appetite, and he walks around angry. But this time the pilots looked at each other surprised. It was a working day, and it would seem that Avdiv had no reason to be displeased. The flight was indeed the fight was and was. Damn it. Failure. Since morning guarded the transport at the crossing, on the radio reporter. Attention, course towards you 27 goats, guarded by Messerschmitts. Attack, attack, and at the same time the wingman Kolograivov transmitted. I see Lapte, coming at us. Here the difference in information is not in substance, but in words. It is not clear exactly how to call Junkers 87. Some, taking into account the habit of 87 to fight on the dive, insist on giving them the name of goats. Others prefer the name of laptops, in honour of their clumsily bitter feet. Those who feet has no serious meaning. Those who fail to drive into the ground laport, easily consoled by drowning in the sea goat. So the crowds went to the transport. It was near Novorossiysk. A dozen yaks, led by Avdiev, quickly deprived the goats of hope to fight near the transport. German bombs were dropped at a respectful distance from the ship, causing serious damage to two dolphins after which the Junkers escaped.
not all of them escaped. Four goats kicked upward, spit and water. This is except for the Messerschmitt, and in the Messerschmitt was the whole matter, because of which Avdiv did not have lunch. That damned Messerschmitt broke through Kologrivov's tank, and he had to go to land. Not only that he was left in the battle without a wingman, with an uncovered tail, so the machine Kologrivovskaya two days to fix he noticed the kraut, attacked Kologrivova, on the tail of the number five, a minute later Avdiev has already found him in the air, caught up and fucked from behind. He went straight down, he decided to run away, his radiator was broken, Avdiev of course also went down, caught up again and hit the radiator again. He saw that the German's engine would last for two minutes, he got close to him and pointed at his neck, it's the end for you. The fascist ducked down to the cabin, neither alive nor dead. Meanwhile, Abdiv doesn't shoot, though one line would have been enough. He has a new thought. There's no reason for the fascist to fall into the sea for nothing. I'll put him on our airfield. Maybe he'll tell something interesting. The German keeps turning away, but Abdiev won't let him turn away. It drives him quietly where he needs to go. He stopped thrashing about, seeing that nothing can be done. Either head down into the water or sit on the shore. I've reached an agreement with the Krauti, I'm taking him home. And at that very minute, when everything was already decided, four lags came out of nowhere. They looked and could not understand anything. The Yak was leading the German, carefully leading, but not firing. They thought he had no ammunition left, we must help our comrade. And they did, damn them. They came up, pounced on him, cut him down. Only a column of water rose. Avdiv had a salty conversation with those lags later at the airfield. But it couldn't be helped. In general, a typical failure. Everything is written exactly, but I had a grudge against Alexander Ivich for a long time. For as soon as I met with any of my colleagues from another regiment, a question invariably follow. I don't think so. I wouldn't have had enough experience. Yes, experience. A few other things. Stamina, perhaps. Ah, stamina already. Very good. And maybe something else? I don't like big words. What's the point of buzzwords? You, so to speak. Abstract yourself. Let's take a pilot abstractly. Let's say Ivanov, Petrov, Sidorov. Those seem to be the most appropriate names. Well, there's something in your reasoning. Self-confidence, the ability not to be confused in a difficult situation, the ability to stand up to the end when necessary. All this comes from the army... Kostya didn't give in immediately, but he seemed to give in. I was reminded of this conversation when I read in Komsomolskaya Pravda the letters of Pavel Akulov, who fell at Demansky. Apparently, everything in life repeats itself somehow, including arguments similar to the ones we had with Kostya. We all grow up in different ways, and as we grow up we become different. I mean our perception of the world. It is for the purpose the meaning of life I have such a law. If you have realized, felt some strong string in yourself, as the old say, some vein, then you should work hard. Strive for this strong point to become your vocation. Which is why are you bemoaning my lost time? And who told you that military service is wasted years? I'd be a prude if I said it's fun as hell, and you don't want to go home. But you see, we all apparently need to live for a while under special laws, when you do not do what you want, but what is necessary. Don't be wise about suppressing your personality, sorry, but I don't think that's even your words. How can I make it clearer? Here we live luxuriously and thoughtlessly, and from this thoughtlessness sometimes there is a thought that everything revolves around you, that you are the navel of the earth. Look how we grew up. In school for many years we were told, you are entitled to this and that, all doors and roads are open to you, the state guarantees you this and that and very rarely were we told what our duties to society should be. Perhaps the teachers thought that we should come to this in time. So in the army I got to it quickly, hard but fast. Judging by your letters, you're still wandering around. Now compare who wins. You're right, of course. That life is measured by how much you do. Don't forget to record a part of your labour on my share because I serve to make your work more comfortable. You see what a philosopher I became in the army? That's about the same thing I said to Kostya then. Hey, say, fathers and children, but don't Akulov's letters to his beloved remind us of our letters in the front triangles. I'm very glad that everything is going well with you, but I am still surprised that you chose such a position for yourself. After all, a teacher should be strict, whether you want to argue or not, but strict. Think back to our school days. Who were the authority figures? 
those teachers who could hear a fly fly in the classroom. True, we didn't always like the strict ones, but they were unquestionable authority, that's for sure. And you're a teacher. When I read your letters, I catch myself thinking that in some ways you are stronger than me. At least in the way you reassure me, it's impossible for us to be together now. So it's necessary. But don't worry, Pashinka. And I do. You know, I miss you so much if they told me to walk to her, I'd go. I'd take your hands and walk together, look at the world with the same eyes, just for a day. I know that soon we will have a lot of time. We have not long left to serve, but I still want to be with you at least for a day. We thought the same way then, near Sevastopol and Kerch, and wrote the same words to our sons and loved ones back home, that Hitlerites were this time more persistent. Long did not turn from the course, or the guys were lucky. Two Mi-109 almost at the very beginning of the battle collapsed in the bay. Soon they were followed by the third. And below somehow calmly, in a homely and businesslike manner, worked ill. And the sky was almost clear of clouds. They were sailing away towards Turkey in a dark shroud. One of the pilots brought a newspaper of 1918 found in the ruins. It passes from hand to hand. Everyone is interested in touching the history. After the capture of Pericop Fedodosia was one of the main points of white evacuation. The newspaper told how it took place. In the harbour stood Molchenov and other vessels. From all outskirts rushed carts, detachments at random, in panic to the centre of the city. All sides' voices were heard. How to get to the port? Where are the steamers? Battling with chains and iron boxes of artillery wagons, artillery was rushing down Italian street straight to the port. There were no steamers in the port. Having loaded, the ships, fearing the incessant flow, withdrew and went to the roadstead. At the sight of the commanders who had abandoned everyone, calmly stationed on the roadstead, fear was replaced by dull apathy and indifference among those who remained. It was all over. The army did not exist. Abandoned wagons, weapons and ammunition were lying in the streets. The whole Alexandrovskaya, now red, square was strewn with lying guns, machine guns, kitchens, and a mass of torn epaulettes. The last agony of the White Guard was coming. And soon they will run away like that, Grib threw, after reading the essay, Grib. Hmm. Who are they? It is clear who Hitler writes. That night I could not sleep for a long time. I was thinking, our successes are undoubted, but there are a lot of losses. In war, we can't do without casualties. That's clear. But how to minimize them? What tactics of fighting and escorting attack aircraft to choose? Only for one month pilots of our guards, unit conducted 75 air battles and shot down 22 enemy aircraft. Our main task was to escort Ilyushin II attack aircrafts that were striking airfields, railroad facilities and watercrafts. We also covered the actions of the attack aircrafts that were smashing the living force. Fire points and enemy equipment on the front line Covering one group of attack aircraft, Ilyushin II was carried out by a group of fighters. The latter formed a group of direct cover aircraft operating on the right, left and rear. For example, a pair of Yak goes at the same altitude as the attack aircraft, behind them and to the right by 200-400 metres. The second pair goes to the left, above the first at 400-500 metres, and the third pair follows below the entire group of attackers. It goes at increased speed, manoeuvring in the zone of anti-aircraft fire, walking on the outside of the combat order of attacking aircraft. We adopted this formation because recently there have been more frequent cases of attacks by Mi-109s on our planes from below, from a shaving flight. They usually sneak up on our attack aircraft when they leave the attack or on the departure from the target. In order to provide reliable cover, Clear and uninterrupted radio communication between fighters and attack aircraft and between fighters and each other is very important. Sometimes our attack aircraft operated in separate groups with an interval of two to ten minutes between strikes. In such cases we built cover in the same way as in the actions of a single group. But we went in pairs, one pair on the left, the other on the right. The outer pair goes at a higher speed and below the attackers. The combat work of all groups of attack aircraft is covered by a strike group of fighters from 612 aircraft. It is located over the enemy territory, on the side of the most likely appearance of enemy fighters at an altitude of 500 to 3,000 meters, in an area that provides constant observation of the actions of attack aircraft. 
The task of the strike group is to restrain enemy fighters on the approach of attack aircraft to the target and to provide assistance to the direct cover groups. The strike group has the ability to maneuver freely and search for enemy aircraft in the area of attack aircraft. Allocation of such a group reduces the number of fighters needed to cover each group of attack aircraft separately, without reducing the effectiveness of their strikes on the enemy. As the fighting progresses, the fighter strike group should build up its strengths and be replenished by the first and subsequent groups of direct cover attack aircraft. A part of the direct cover aircraft should join the strike group after the attacking aircraft have gone beyond the range of the enemy fighters. This organization of cover can be provided only by a clear agreement on the ground. Excellent knowledge of each pilot assigned to the group of tasks and its place in the system of combat order in the target area, as well as well-established, uninterrupted radio communication. During one of the bombing attacks, three groups of attack aircraft were operating. I was part of a six-man team representing the strike group. We came to the target area together with the first group of attack aircraft at an altitude of 600 meters. When the Ilyushins were diving on the target, we noticed that six Mi-109s were sneaking up on them from the enemy side. We immediately went on the attack and tied them up in combat. The air battle lasted for 30 minutes until the Ilys finished attacking enemy targets. After the withdrawal of the attackers to a safe zone, I, as a leader, ordered by Radio 1 pair from the direct cover group to come to us for reinforcements. This pair managed to gain altitude and helped us by operating from above. Then one pair from the second direct cover group also came to reinforce us. As a result of such organization of interaction of fighter groups, we did not allow any enemy aircraft to our attack aircraft, and our pilots shot down me 109. The described air battle took place within the range of visibility of our attack aircraft, not over the target. All our planes returned safely to their airfields. The order of formation of fighter groups and tactical maneuver used by us in conjunction with skillful, organized actions of pilots provided good results of the cover. The night passed unnoticed. It is necessary to talk about all this with all pilots today. For those who do not learn from their own mistakes, they are beaten. The regiment landed in Annapa. The airfield is a site on the beach, Meters 30 to 40 meters from the airfield, under it had to clear vineyards, a cliff to the sea. We couldn't resist, we walked around the city. Anapa lay in ruins. The weather was bad. In fact, it was the culprit of all our torments. At takeoff, the clay was a squall of mud rising from the wheels and hitting the propeller. The blades were bent, but we had to fly. We used all possible ingenuity. We oiled the wheels to prevent the clay from sticking, cleared the mud, rolled the ground and the cars got up in the air with half a heartbeat. It is now I, an old soldier, can analyze the past based on many years of experience. And then, although I had already been promoted to the rank of major and was awarded the hero of the Soviet Union, in terms of age we all had, to put it bluntly, was not rich. That's why our disputes were sometimes too fierce, and there was no shortage of categorical judgments in these discussions. Kostya V. He jumped down to the ground and looked at the sun setting behind the edge of the mountains with some surprised eyes. I looked at his car. There was not a living place on it. It seemed that someone had tried to make the dural with holes and punctures as much as possible. It's amazing, Misha, how I managed to get away with it today. Two messers were hanging on my tail almost to the airfield. The guys helped me out. And guess what? No scratches. Just a piece of my jacket. What is that? Fatalism. What does fatalism have to do with it? If we were shot down in every battle, who would have fought then? My tried to joke. We walked in silence for a while. We sat down on a crate by the Caponia. You know, Misha Kostya began unexpectedly. I read somewhere about the so-called military happiness. That, they say, our profession has its own romance, its own, if you like, attractiveness. But in my opinion, it's all nonsense. We fight because we can't not fight. Such a time, such an era. I used to dream of being a city planner, to build cities in the Arctic Circle, and so many years have been spent on wars on the army. Wait, Kostya, your head is a mess. Everything is mixed up. Wars. Well, we and our fathers have had too many of them. Maybe there's some reason in your reasoning. Indeed, it's the times we live in. I don't agree about the army. Didn't it give you anything? Why not? It gave me something. Hmm, something? Would you change your profession now? Stop being a pilot? You're crazy. Acostia even lifted himself up. 
Apparently, I touched something very heartfelt. Aha, Costia was hurt. Why are you angry? You're sick of everything. Oh, don't twist things around. Being a pilot is happiness. And who made you a pilot? End the test. But did it only teach you how to fly an airplane? How many Hitlerites have you shot down? Eight. No. Could you have shot down even one when you entered the school? Costia thought about it. I will present the engineer for an award. Right, hmm, said Ermashenkov. Makeev received four orders during the war, and now standing on the plane of the Yuck, looks at me calm, not saying much. He asked, Where to, Commander? To Fyodosia Fedor Vasilevic. I answer the engineer. Cover the attackers. Everything is clear, says. Mercy Gilatin, I wish you good luck. They say that the sea is the same everywhere. In any case, this does not apply to the Black Sea. Delicate in the Blue Bay near Chersonesos, it passes into turquoise of Cuckbell Bay and leaden colour of Dead Bay. Theodosia Bay looks light blue from above in sunny weather. If it were not for the acute minute-by-minute -minute feeling that an unprecedented war is raging in the world, if the armadas of two regiments of attack aircrafts and two regiments of fighters were not visible on the left, right and behind, it would be possible to look endlessly at this endless blueness and blue mountains blazing in the haze. How many gulfs, bays and seas I have not seen in my life, the light gamut of the Black Sea is inimitable. We were heading for Feodosia, me and Alexei V on the Vochkins, others on Yaks, the machines are excellent, and it would seem that we had already got used to fighting over the sea, but hardly absolutely all of our pilots overcame the feeling of nervousness hidden in the deepest depths of their souls. Partly they could be understood. It was one thing for a pilot to fight over land. If they get hit, it is still possible to somehow land the wounded machine, or, at the worst, eject with a parachute and get to their own. If they shoot down over the sea, and even in the rear of the enemy, no, everything is more complicated. First of all, it is not known when the boats will come to rescue you from the trouble. But the enemy is no fool. His boats may be ahead of yours, and you can't land a downed land plane on the waves. Such a landing is almost certainly an instant death. The machine will go underwater before the pilot can get out of the cockpit. To fly and fight over the sea behind enemy lines, you had to have double courage. And we, the old guys, had to fly the young ones not only for experience and skill, but also for the well-known fight against water fear to make a newcomer feel as confident over the sea as over the land. He could find a way out in the most serious situation not to panic, not to lose his cool. Whether we were detected from the shore, or we failed to ensure the secrecy of the operation. But the enemy fighters met us on the approach to the target, over the bay. By that time, our combat experience had developed a certain tactics of combat. The turning radius of the Yak is smaller than that of the Mesa, taking advantage of this. We tried to get into the enemy's tail, and at the same time from the very beginning of the battle, in any case, do not let the initiative of the attack out of their hands. Experience showed that if we managed to shoot down at least one fascist at the beginning of the battle, the psychological and tactical advantage, as a rule, remained firmly on our side. Somehow it so happened that Messers immediately cut off Alexeyev. I rushed to the rescue, but two Hitlerites got in the way. I see fire trails stretching to my cabin. Fortunately, their threads pass somewhere to the left below. I think it's gone. And suddenly there's a bang. My face floods with blood. I throw the plane down. I look around. I see that the cockpit lantern is also covered in blood. First thought, down. But what the hell, I don't feel any pain. I pull the car out of the dive. It obeys. I lift it up. It's going. I wiggle my arms. There's no pain. Just a sore forehead. I run my fingers across my forehead, pulling off the stuck bone. It's incomprehensible. I'm thinking hard. If it's my bone, then why am I alive? If it's not mine, then where is the blood coming from, and in general, what actually happened? Fortunately, there was no time to ponder. Having looked around, I realized that in a minute or two I wouldn't have to think at all. A messer was tailing me. Sharp, the handle away from myself. Falling down. Speeding up gaining altitude again, and I see Alexeyev next to me. Apparently he's already managed to fight back. He's got a worried look on his face. What happened? Are you alive? You're covered in blood. Alexeyev's voice in the headphones has a sobering effect. Indeed, what happened? 
I look around. There seems to be no danger nearby. Messes go away, pursued by yaks. Below on the water, floating debris. With pain in my soul, I notice from our attack aircraft. And only now I saw it. It bloody feathers stuck to the armoured glass. And finally I guessed. It was a seagull that hit the windshield. The plexiglass was penetrated, but the plate could not. The blood and the crumbs from the body almost put me out of commission. I read somewhere that an airplane collided with an eagle. But it was the first time I'd ever experienced such a thing. Indeed, what does not happen in war, and how many ridiculous accidents cannot be foreseen in advance. Alive, hmm. I answer Alexeyev. A seagull struck the plane. Enough talk. My comrade didn't believe me. Maybe you'll come back home. Do you need help? Let's go to the target. And in Feodosia port, the flames were already roaring. The stormtroopers began their work. The telephonogram came in the morning. In the current circumstances, when a clear transportation link with the Kerch Peninsula, the destruction of enemy torpedo boats in the northern part of the Black Sea, one of the most important priority tasks. According to intelligence data, the enemy's boats are based mainly in the ports of Feodosia and Kiikatlama. From here they go out to act on our sea communications in the areas of Taman and Tuaps. Conducting additional aerial reconnaissance, destroy enemy torpedo boats in the ports of Feodosia and Kiikatlama. Get me OQ. Urgent? Yes, sir. I received the telephonogram. What's the composition of forces for the operation? Pretty L2s, 20 York 9s, 20 Lag 3s. The operation must be prepared especially carefully. Take into account all possible complications. Yes, sir. Actually, such an operation was not a novelty for us. More than once and more than twice, covering attack aircrafts, we went to smash the enemy's watercrafts in Feodosia and Kiai Katlamu. But these were ordinary raids to defeat. Now the task was to destroy the torpedo fleet of the Germans in the northern part of the Black Sea. Nothing could be done. It was necessary to gather the senior staff of the division units. It was decided to invite also senior navigators. They had extensive experience in combat work. We met for several hours. Concluding, Commander Manjosov said, So we act by the method of sequential combined massive bombing attacks of several groups. We attack from different directions. This is a common task. Now E, with all the flying staff, should be held group exercises to work out all the details of bombing attacks and the organization of interaction between attacking aircraft and fighters. Our whole mechanism must work like clockwork. I schedule the operation for March 11th. You have three days to spare. Do it. All three days' clouds hung low over the airfield. It rained. Partly it was good. Nobody interfered with us. Barraging almost on a shave, the pilots rehearsed the performance. Seeing with excitement, we waited for the morning of the 11th. The weather would not let us down. Being at four o'clock in the morning, I came out of the dugout. A sharp wind was blowing from the sea. I noticed one, second, third stars in the sky. This is not bad. It means that the clouds are dissipating. It would be better if there was no solid fog. It is a frequent guest in spring in the Crimean foothills. Two mortis that I am not alone. Two more figures are looking at the sky at the neighboring Caponias. I approach. I see Belozirov and Kulikov. You should sleep, comrades. You're the first to go. That's why I can't sleep. It's already dawn. 755. Two Yak 9s took to the air. Belozirov and Kulikov set a course for Feodosia and Kikat Lama. Their goal is reconnaissance. Lime stretches languidly and tediously. Only about nine o'clock a messenger came running. There is a radiogram. Boats are detected. Four Mi-109 are barreling over Theodosia. Cloudiness, 89 points. The largest number of boats in Kikatlam. Soon land and the scouts themselves. Clarified the data. The decision is made to attack Kimkatlam. Groups take off and clearly lined up in combat formation. It seems that three days have not gone in vain. The mechanism really works like clockwork. Approaching the port. Six messes coming straight at us. We take the fight. The traditional air merry-go-round begins, 